you are listening to an event recorded at Houseman's Bookshop. For more recorded talks and forthcoming events, please visit Houseman's website. Hello. <laughs> Welcome everyone to Houseman. So excited to have tonight the original members of Lesbian and Gay Men Support the Minors, LSGM, from the movie Pride, which I'm sure you've all seen. Um, so I have Jonathan with me, Mike and Devin, and what's going to happen is they're just going to chat a little bit about how the book came about, and it's going to be pretty much an informal event. Afterwards, we can sign up sign our books and, and chat and we'll have some, some wine ready for you. So I'm going to hand over to Jonathan, Mike and Devin. Please give them a warm welcome. Um, thank you. Thank you all for, for coming. Uh, I just thought I'd say a few words about how the book itself came about. Um, when the movie had been released uh, and it had been out for probably about six months or so, uh, the publishers, John Blake, uh, no relationship no, of Jonathan Blake, uh, John Blake got in contact with David Livingston, who was the producer of the movie, to say, hi guys, we love the movie, we're amazed to see that there's no book tie-in, can we do one for you? And David Livingston, uh, quite rightly, said, well, really, it, it's not us, the people who made the movie you need to speak to, it's the people it's about, LGSM. So um, John Blake got in contact with myself uh, and we got together, met the publishers. They given up, gave us an option as to whether we wanted to write the book ourselves and we're all too old and knackered now to, <laughs> to be bothered to do something like that. So um, he phoned us a, a writer, uh, Tim Tate. And when Tim first met us, he said, I can't possibly tell your story, it's your story. I see myself as a curator of your story. And what he did, poor man, he interviewed 16 of us, about two hours each, transcribed it from an audio tape into, into print, and then chopped up the conversations, cut and pasted, and wove a little narrative thread through it, kind of explaining the background to what was going on. Uh, back in the day. So it very much is a book that, that's our voices. Do you want to add to that at all? Um, I think mainly we'd like to answer questions because, and also to hear from you um, about your reactions to the film and about um, your reactions to the story and so forth and also potentially I guess and maybe if you've actually all look a bit young. Normally there's people who are involved in the 84, 85 strike <laughs> Um, who have their own stories as well, and it's always really fascinating to, to learn about those and ha how they relate, because obviously it was a mass movement of people, it wasn't just LGSM, there were all sorts of people involved in, in supporting the miners at that point. But I think one of the reasons that we felt that the book is important, because obviously the film is dramatised, it's fictionalised, it's not a documentary. Um, so, although it's very much based on reality, and I think it does an amazing job of capturing the spirit of the time, certainly the spirit of LGSM, and it does an amazing job at showing just how much fun we had. Um, it's not the real, true story, and I think the book is part of a corrective to that. One particular point, of course, is the film focuses on five or six people, chosen in some cases almost at random. In other cases, obviously, you couldn't make the film without referring to, to Mike or without having Mike and Mark as main characters, but. Mm -hmm. Other people were chosen for particular purposes because there were kind of narrative threads or dramatic things could be um, attached to their story in some way. Uh, so I think I was chosen simply because um, Stephen wanted to contrast the experience of Cliff um, as a gay man growing up in Wales and deciding to sacrifice his gay life, as it were, in order to remain within his community. And from that, he gained that kind of continuity with his, he continued the relationship with his family and with his community, as opposed to the Gethin character, a gay man growing up in Wales who decides to leave Wales to come to London to live a gay life and largely lose his contact with family and community and so forth. And I think that's a story which resonates with lots and lots of lesbian and gay people from all over the world, people growing up in rural communities or in religious families or whatever, have faced that kind of dilemma for generations. 
and I was chosen, you know, in terms of because of uh, of being one of the sort of early diagnosed HIV positive. Uh, and Stephen wanted to produce that, you know, bring that into the uh, the story. And what is very interesting is, of course, that he has got sort of uh, the television advertisement, uh, you know, don't die of ignorance, which actually didn't happen. It hadn't happened uh, during the course of the strike. That was something that happened in the, in uh, in 1987. But he wanted to do that so that there was a, a story and he wanted to be able to sort of pinpoint about sort of my survival and Mark's dying. So sort of um, that was, and also sort of within it, which I, which I love, is the fact that sort of getting uh, and I have a relationship, <laughs> but I actually have a relationship with someone called Nigel and we've been together for 34 years uh, and we did not live above gays the word. Yeah. And we but, certainly never had, well, I never had, I don't know about Jonathan and Nigel, but I never had that outrageous pink dildo. No. <laughs> yeah. it, it was his. Yeah. <laughs> he would say that. But, uh, you know, for Stephen, what was important was that Gaze the Word was in it, because he had heard about the, the Gaze the Word sort of struggle for its survival when, when uh, customers' exercise had raided them and sort of taken away their stock. Uh, and uh, so he wants to, to bring that bookshop into that story, which he hoped would then sort of help it sort of uh, were the film to, uh, to take off. And of course, the film has taken off and people do indeed go and visit Face the Word because of the film. So, so the book provides an opportunity for another dozen or so people to get their story out there mm -hmm. um, and it's a kind of valuable addition to the film. So hopefully you buy it. Um, and there's other stuff that needs writing. There's other stuff that needs researching. There's a lot of the story which is as yet untold. Mm -hmm. There isn't a definitive, this isn't a definitive history of LGSM. And I think that's up to future generations of historians. And there are people working in universities who are writing up stuff around it. So there's definitely more to come. <laughs> Any questions, anybody? How many people have seen the movie? N nearly everybody. Right? How many yeah. people have seen it more than once? <laughs> Quite a lot. <laughs> How many people have seen it 107 times? No, he was born 10 miles from where I grew up, so it, 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 it was dead easy for him, yeah, yeah, surely. Mm. But the guy who played Mark Ashton, he's actually a New Yorker, and I thought his Northern Irish accent was amazing, Ben Schnetzer. And the movie company really did, the director and Stephen really did hold out to get Ben because they wanted someone... Mark's age and Mark was 25 ostensibly and they said it couldn't really have worked to get an, an older actor and yet because it's a main character it's asking a lot for a 25 year old to have all the talents necessary but I think Ben did a fantastic job of it yeah, yeah. yeah. and we were just discussing earlier uh, the Bromley character in the movie is completely fictitious he's there because Stephen wanted someone to go on a, 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 a learning journey from the beginning of the film to the end. Um, so Bromley, it, it, he starts off Gay Pride March 1984, he's still in the closet, uh, he's sneaking off on the Gay Pride March to, 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 to have his first experience as it were. And so he's on this amazing journey of discovery and he's learning what people under the age of 40 are watching the movie didn't know about you know what life was like for the LGBT community what the minor strike was all about the the the, the, the extent of the minor strike how what how, what an impact it was having on Britain and so although Bromley is a completely fictitious character he's one of my favorite characters in the movie I love him when you think about it no self-respecting member of LGSM would have still been living at home with mum and dad. Fuck that for a game of soldiers. We were off. <laughs> but actually, you know, though he's an invented character, he's really real. 
And, you know, I mean, there were just so many people like that. And I think the yeah. other character who's totally invented and really real is Gwen. I mean, so many young gay men in South Wales have come up to me and said, oh, I love Gwen. She's just like my auntie. <laughs> you know, I mean, that kind of... She stands in for a whole load of um, women who are just like that. Mm, um, mm. And, and uh, inventive, but absolutely real. Yeah, yeah. He's going to do it again in a minute. <laughs> oh, my God. Turn the music on now. No, no. It's about to be uh, no, there, 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 there is a, a, a wonderful photograph by a woman called Imogen Young, who caught me uh, in the act of, uh, of just joy at being there and dancing. Um, and it was from that that uh, Dominic got his, uh, his table dance. But I would have danced just like that. <laughs> how, how was your first meeting in the village with the Miami Sea? I mean, you know, I'm sure this movie had some freedom to kind of dramatize and do that and all of that to keep the audience happy. But from your perspective, how, how was it? How, how was it? Yeah, go on. It, 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 well, it was very different, actually. Uh, the irony is what happened in reality, I think, would have been so unbelievable that actually if they'd have depicted it, the, the, the people wouldn't have believed it. There were actually 27 of us went down in three vehicles, not eight. Um, 22 men, five women. We're mainly in our 20s. Uh, we were all kind of, ch well, with a few exceptions. Yeah, uh, some of us weren't in our 20s. Yeah. Uh, they're all kind of charity shop chic. Um, very conspicuous, very small. Most of LGSM mm. were five foot five and smaller. <laughs> the, the giants that were a bit rare. We uh, went into the miners' welfare hall for their social on the Saturday night. There were two or three hundred people in in the hall. We weren't the only supporters down that weekend. There were uh, print worker trade unions there that weekend, uh, Haringey, Nalgo was there. Brent Nalgo, was it? Br was it Brent, yeah. yeah. Um, that fist yeah. theme that appears at various points out the, the thing, that's actually taken from the Brent Nalgo banner. Okay. And Brent Nalgo was one of the key supporters right. of yeah. Mr. Lesson Swansea. So we weren't the only ones there that weekend, but we were certainly the biggest group that weekend. And as we walked through the double swing doors in the main hall, the whole tenor of the conversation has dropped. Now, there were kids running around, there were grandmas and granddads, every generation, and that was obviously a res response to our presence. And we were all walking in single file, thinking, oh shit. And then somebody started clapping, and the whole two to three hundred of them started clapping. And that's when we knew history had changed. All they knew about us was that we were queer, and we supported their struggle, and that was it. And five or six pints later, by 11 o'clock, we'd all become big buddies. <laughs> Do you think you would have had that reception in North East? Because That's I was living in the North East, in a mining town, in the Cove Strike, right? Miners Strike. I was living there. Yeah. I wasn't out, by the way, even though I am a gay woman. I yeah, yeah. about there at all. So I was only 17, so come on. Yeah. Give me a break. Mm. But um, what I'm saying, I mean, would you have. I mean, do, do you, you think you would have had to be soon? Because I remember, I'm going to say something terrible, but I'm not, I'm going to stop talking. Stop talking. Stop talking. There's people behind you can't anyway, hear. I'm sorry. Um, but I remember, because I, I went, I was at technical college at the time, and I remember there was this guy that may have been gay that came to the party at the college because he came in a pink jumpsuit as a man. He was, long, he was a, he was a he was a goth, but he came in a pink jumpsuit and nailed on the shine. And honestly, the miners, because they, they went to, the apprentices went to the college and they absolutely, we were feeding him with our bodies. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm really sorry. And, 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 and nobody knew I was in it. Yeah. He was a girl choosing yeah. this guy. And he wasn't even saying he was gay. Mm. And I'm just thinking that, you know, the massive, all I think now is, you know, what you did was massively brave because I was witness to that and it was around that time, I think it was just before, actually. I think it's a really that. interesting question. So do you think, it was, first of all, I think it was incredibly brave what you did because I was there and I don't think people maybe recognise the extent mm. of the homophobia in those communities. And then, you know, 
on top of that, you know, you walked in there and, and those sort of things were happening mm. all the time. I think it is really interesting. One thing that I, I do know is that um, quite a few years prior to 1984, um, when Ted Heath was introducing his uh, Industrial Relations mm. Bill, mm. Um, a group called Gay Left, I think it inspired a lot of us, and yeah. Yeah. Nigel Young, Jonathan's real life partner, was one of those people involved in Gay Left. They'd organised a, what I think is the first out lesbian and gay contingents on a trade union yeah. march. Yeah. So they joined the march against the, yeah. um, against Ted Heath's Industrial Relations mm -hmm. Bill. And certainly some of the reports <coughs> from them, but people who attended that, re report actually a warm welcome. I mean, a frosty welcome from most people, but a warm welcome from the Durham Miners Association. Um, and Durham Miners stood out on that march in, in terms of their response to there being a, a queer presence. So that might indicate something, but to, I mean, I at the time was going out with, um, I, I mean, my partner for, uh, for 16 years who subsequently died of AIDS. Um, he, he was a miner's son from uh, Shotton Colliery. So I spent quite a lot of time prior to the strike and during the strike um, in the miners' welfare and, um, in Shotton yeah. and in Easington, um, <laughs> and people knew. Born. Oh right, yes. I mean, pe people knew that we were gay. Yeah. But they knew who his father was, and they knew who his yeah. cousins were, and the rest of it. And they all worked in the pit, um, and we never had any yeah. negative well, reaction. That was. said, I do think South Wales was particularly open, mm -hmm. um, and particularly the East Coast and Swansea Valley. Mm -hmm. I think were particularly open to that because they were a community that had this enormous long history of solidarity, particularly international solidarity. Um, so they were a community which had had a relationship over generations by that point with um, Spanish miners and with um, the Spanish Republic, um, the international brigades. So that had started when, um, in 1928, I think, when, when the coal owners brought in Asturian miners as strike breakers mm. um, and those Asturian miners turned out to be anarcho-syndicalists <laughs> and as soon as they realised they'd been brought in to break a strike they joined the strike mm. and they immediately became part of the community and many of them settled there and um, lived in and inter, you know intermarried so there's now lots of people with names like Pedro Williams and um, mm. Antonio James and all this kind of stuff so there's lots of Welsh Spanish things and um, during the Spanish Civil War, obviously people know that the, the largest contingents to get from the United Kingdom were South Wales miners. Um, after Guernica, um, South Wales in particular, Wales in general, um, gave homes to thousands of um, Basque children who, who were uh, sent here for safety. Um, they, Dallas Valley literally sent hundreds of thousands of tons of aid <coughs> Spain during the war. So they really understood about solidarity. They also had that relationship with Paul Robeson, um, who, who made some films in South Wales, got to um, establish a relationship with South Wales miners. He was the great Amer American, black American singer and communist. Um, and in the 50s, when he was barred from traveling, his passport being confiscated because of his membership with the American Communist Party, um, he continued that relationship. Uh, and sang down the telegraph wire to uh, a community in, in, in the Dallas Valley. Um, you know, this is a community in Ontrim that where Jonathan's great dancing is set. The Miners Lodge had sat there and composed a telegram of communication to Mao Zedong on the completion of the Great March. So this was a geographically remote community, yes, and it was a very well-speaking community, but it was a community which had enormous international awareness and international ties and a real understanding of solidarity so one of the things that we had in common was that kind of uh, you know kind of interest in uh and respect for people like that for, for ropes and and, and the uh international brigades and the rest of it. that gives an immediate point of contact but i also think it was part of the reason that they were open to it because they just understood what solidarity was about um 
So we, perhaps it wouldn't have worked with another community. I, On the other hand, we don't know that. I, I'm saying that because that happened before the mining strike, so maybe things were, would have turned. Yeah. I don't know, mm. because that would have reignited really people. I think what's really, really interesting is that in 2015, yeah. um, so many, and now, so many mining communities see this as part of their story. Yeah. Um, you know, in, in 85, miners and miners' wives came on the Gay Pride March. Mm. It was, they were all from South Wales. They were mm. from four pits at most. Mm. The film exaggerates a little. Mm. <laughs> it wasn't coach after coach yeah. after coach. But they were from the four pits that we'd had a relationship with. 2015, on the Gay Pride March, we had all of those people from the South Wales collieries, mm. former South Wales mining communities and more. Mm. We had people from former mining communities in Kent, in Nottingham, in Yorkshire, Durham, Scotland, right. Lancashire. Um, yeah. And all of those people came because they identified with the story yeah. and felt it was their story. Yeah. So and I think that, you know, they, they really bought into it. Yeah. Um, yeah. The reception we get when we go on Pride Marches in those kind of areas, you were at Doncaster yeah. the other day, yeah. Um, yeah. Durham Miners Association, I think you know, we're now a fixture at the, at the big meet. Yeah. Yeah, it's a big meeting at the Durham Minor Gala. Um, so I think that's a, an incredible legacy, really. And just to add to that, in, in 2015 at the uh, Doncaster Pride March, the, the miners, there were four banners, and the, those banners actually led the Gay Pride March. They were the first four banners on the march, and I just thought that was fantastic, mm -hmm. really cool. Uh, yeah. And what's great about all this is it's so counterintuitive you know that the Thatcher government and the right-wing media always demonize the miners as brutes uh, hooligans thugs the enemy within etc oh how do you square that with actually these people played a large part of the emancipation of the LGBT community in the United Kingdom yeah these brutes this mob yeah um, so you know, that, that's one of the things that we're really proud of, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And the question? Maybe it's a little bit of a stupid question, but I was wondering, any, are there any gay miners? Cliff, Cliff, Cliff portrayed in the movie uh, was gay. Um, he wasn't out in the sense that he wore gay badges. Uh, but on the other hand, when 27 young gay activists came flooding down into his village, if he'd have been in the closet, he'd have hidden under the table. Um, far from it. He made friends with us right from the outset. He put people up from the group. And within a few weeks, he was making independent visits down to London to stay with us. So, yeah, Cliff was out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And... Um, there always were, I mean, obviously, there always were gay miners. Um, Sean James, who's portrayed in the father, uh, uh, portrayed in the film, her father was a miner. His buddy was gay. Everybody knew it. Um, it wasn't spoken about, uh, but it was absolutely known in the same way as people knew about Cliff. Uh, and there obviously there were others. And I think that's true across every coal field. Mm. Yeah. Gay miners. I mean, you think of the great politicians and the mining tenor and Bevan in his day, but there were still laws against. Do you think there were gay miners then they had to hide what they did? Nothing like that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I mean, sort of the, the, the point was that, that, that up until the law changed, or, you know, we were partially decriminalized, uh, homosexuality was a, was a crime, mm. you know, punishable by prison, mm. fines. So, yes. Mm. You know, uh, for for many many years, we had to to hide things. You know, so there was a, a tremendous amount of subterfuge, mm. and hence you get, for instance, Polari. Mm. You know, secret to, secret or coded to, coded language, mm. which but, even happened on the BBC. So Round the Horn was full of Polari. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> but one thing that's important to remember: one of the earliest gay activists. Uh, in 1950s was a working class man who lived in a mining community, Alan Horsfall, yeah. and he 
uh, was very influential, if not the person who set up the precursor to the campaign for homosexual equality, uh, the North West Committee for Homosexual Law Reform. And he wrote a letter. Uh, he was living in a, in a mining tide cottage in uh, Atherton, I think it was. And he wrote a letter to, uh, uh, I think it was a new statesman, challenging the NUM leadership to come out in support of homosexual law reform. And he said something like, uh, because if the leadership feels that there's going to be any resistance from the mining community, I don't think so, because I, I live in Atherton and there's, it's not a problem for us. And I think he was just proving that it was the leadership that was more timorous than ordinary grassroots people. And we find that time and time and time again. I mean, the number of Labour politicians who got in the bloody way because they thought the people weren't ready for this kind of thing. And you'd go, but they are. It's you who's not ready for it. Oh, no, I've got nothing against you people. <laughs> the great giveaway. I've nothing against you people. <laughs> My great uncle was an out gay minor. My grandmother's brother. But oh, yeah. the reason why he got away with it, and I don't advocate this, is because he went to meet him up and he got the toes of the biggest one and broke his arm and said, don't do that to me again. And after that, he went <laughs> left alone. Yeah. Um, and so he was now a gay minor. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But he did. He had to break someone's arm to be accepted. But yeah. I don't advocate what he did, and now was he really, but mm. that's the then. Yeah, yeah. And then that was fine. It's yeah. like, well, you know, you're, you're not a... Yeah. We, you know, uh, so they had a different view of him. I went to say yeah. was, but he was out in and yeah, I mean, you've also got to think about the context of, of yeah. sexuality in Britain in the 50s, 60s and yeah. 70s. You know, the, the, what's that play? No, no sex, please. Yeah. We're British, you know. Yeah. But heterosexual people didn't like talking about sex. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, it, it's know not it. just an LGBT I thing. Later, but that was, that's the truth my grandmother. Yeah. 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 I just wondered, um, I know you can't speak for the lesbian women that went, but I just wonder if you know generally how they were received in the community, were they part of the same way that they're getting on or you said there was a smaller number of being that part Yeah. Um, read the book. Because actually, I think I'm not I'm not uh, hedging there. It's just that that actually is given different voices by both the women and the men. So rather than one of us say it, you can read it for yourself and you'll find different interpretations of it. Yeah. But I think one of the things that the film does get right is that the, um, the vegetarianism, particularly because you know, the women were more inclined to be vegetarian and vegetarianism was more of an issue. <laughs> There is one uh, moment when we, uh, it was the day of the Pits and Perverts Bowl and, and the mining community was coming up from South Wales and we then, our home was the Fallen Angel pub in Islington, which was a, had a very good vegetarian, exclusive vegetarian menu. And they had put on a <laughs> banquet for the miners, white tablecloths, silver service, etc. And it, the food was fabulous. But the, mi the mining community had all panicked because it was going to be a vegetarian meal. So they all gorged themselves on fish and chips before they actually arrived to sit down and eat this meal. And they just couldn't eat it because they were just so full and they really did regret it because it looked so and was so beautiful. Yeah, it's quite embarrassing for everybody that was. <laughs> was it really so harsh, did you, to find a community that would accept you as support? And also, was it hard for Mark? Was he really the one who got you all involved and how did you do that? Do you want to me? Yeah. Uh, no, the Mark's a bit over-egged. Uh, we were very, very much a collective organisation and we were very, very horizontal. Um, uh, there was a complete mix of people in there, the CPers, IMG, SWP, Socialist Action, uh, people Party. Labour Party, oh, I've forgotten them. <laughs> um, people who'd not been involved in politics before, we even had a narco syndicalist, which really impressed me because I had no bloody idea what a narco syndicalist even was. Uh, and Mark was CP. Um, he was gobby. He was very charismatic and he had a lot to say for himself. But no, Mark, Mark, he, and he was a press officer for the group. But uh, it was very much a, 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 a collective organisation. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think so. And, and in terms of 
finding a community to twin with. I, I'm not sure. I don't think we didn't approach other people beforehand, did we? I mean, no. We no. found mm. almost by accident um, through a, you know one contact. We found this relationship. Had that initial meeting with Di Donovan, which I think the film kind of portrays pretty much accurately as it happened. Mm. Had that immediate warm response. I've never met any gay people before, but hey, let's go with it. Um, started sending money down, and pretty soon afterwards, we were invited down, um, and three coaches, three buses of us went down, got lost, arrived in the middle of the night, camped out on Di Donovan's floor, as portrayed in the film, except there were 27 of us. Um, and then it took off from there. Mm-hmm. Have we answered your question there? Definitely. Good. Okay. In terms of the book, how many people in, that were involved in the the group were they all involved in the book, or some people were picked out particularly to be involved in the book, or, or was everybody um, included? <laughs> Notwithstanding the fact that 30 years is a long time and people are dead now, both in our community and in the South Wales community, everybody who we had contact details with was invited to contribute to the book, but not everybody chose to take that up. Uh, But certainly the book gives a much wider range of voices than the movie does. Lady behind. That's in there because that's exactly what happened. And do you know what I learned to do really early on? When people said you should be collecting for the gay community, blah, blah, blah. what I'd do before I answered anything, I'd say, before I answer that, can you tell me what you do for the gay community? And never a single one ever did anything for anybody. Yeah, complainers. And of course, we were doing all kinds of things because that's the nature of the beast. We were activists. So Mark and I were on gay switchboard, other people were involved in the trade union branches, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I'm really glad that that's in there because it does point that out. And we did have our detractors, you know. Uh, and we got people as we were collecting. I remember uh, one couple having a go at us because they were anti-miners. They thought miners were all violence and anti-gay and everything. And this huge guy was listening to the conversation, got 20 quid out of his pocket, put it in our bucket and just looked at these guys in the face and said, my dad's a miner. And they just shut up then. <laughs> This guy's been waiting patiently. <laughs> Thank you. I was just wondering, how do you feel uh, about the activism that you did in LGSM and the impact that that has had on the LGBT community in general and also society in general? How do you feel that? Ha- what's your legacy to now? I mean, for me, I think it's a mixture of like kind of pride, but also um, really recognizing that we were just building so much on what other people had done. So we didn't just pluck buckets from underneath the kitchen sink and pluck ideas from thin air. We were (coughs) building on previous generations of activism. So particularly people like the Gay Left Collective, the Gay Liberation Front, who, you know, kind of 10, 15 years prior to us. And before that, there had been uh, people like Alan Horsell um, and people involved in CHE. And before that, of course, there were people like Edward Carpenter and Harry Hay in in the state. So there was, you know, kind of a, a century of activism that had preceded us. Activism by people for instance, like um, Edward Carpenter, you know, he was, like us, a socialist, uh, one of the founders of the International Labour Party. He was a feminist of the campaign for uh, women's suffrage. 
he was a, an early environmentalist um, and he was a campaigner for lesbian and gay rights. Um, and similarly, uh, Harry Hay, you know, kind of a campaigner for Native American rights, uh, an environmentalist, uh, uh, a feminist, um, a socialist, a communist. Um, so these were people who really had similar ideas, similar um, commitments to us, uh, and were an inspiration. And we were building on, on what they they did. And you know, we obviously we're part of that. And then there's things that have happened afterwards. I mean, there's kind of you know the, the whole raft of activism that was needed before we got to the stage of where we are. And there's more stuff needs doing. Really great to see somebody wearing a lesbian skateboard, the migrant t shirt. You know, there's a whole new generation of, of, act, of activists who are continuing on that same struggle for building connections between different communities, for um, showing solidarity with people who are vilified and depressed now in the same way, same way that we were vilified and depressed 30 years ago. And what is extraordinary is just up the road at the British Library, there is at the moment uh, an exhibition about sort of um, gay love, law and liberty. And that traces the kind of the, the, the history from the very, very early, early days, right the way through sort of, you know, to the present day and with questions as to sort of, you know, what is next? And it's well worth a, a visit. And it's free. <laughs> Always helps. Have you been back to the village in Wales? Do you go back often? Do you keep in touch with the, the people there? And why and why did you choose that village? Why Wales? There was something, there was a phone book, wasn't it? I can't quite no. remember. Um, <laughs> there had been a, a, a group called Labour Campaign for Lesbian and Gay Rights that had donated £40, I think, to that very same community. Uh, and one of the guys who was in that a guy called Hugh Williams basically had that direct contact. And but that was it, really. It wasn't anything more than that. It could have been absolutely any mining community in Britain. But in retrospect, I'm really pleased we we chose South Wales. Yeah. And it was a letter, not a phone call, that was made. Yeah. And we have been back. Yeah. Because um, there was a thirtieth anniversary reunion uh, in the uh, in the onsen and in the, the the hall which was extraordinary mm. i mean you know, the emotions are just so high um and to sort of uh, to re-meet because there were some people i mean sort of going down some people sort of that one hadn't seen in 30 mm -hmm. years, mm -hmm. others uh, that one had, uh, had continued and had relationships. Nigel and I used to go and stay with uh, with Cliff, if we were going down to Wales, and he would sort of come up to London. But some people one hadn't seen, and that was just mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. And once again, the sort of welcome that we were given yeah. <coughs> was fabulous. I mean, I think some people kept in touch more than others. Yeah. Um, so quite a few of us did keep in touch with people like Sean and with Cliff and Davina and so forth. Um, other people didn't so much, but would come down. I think we had a big um, get together on the 10th anniversary and then again on the 30th. I don't think we did much on the 20th, but perhaps no, we did, perhaps no. I was drunk. I was drunk a lot of the time. <laughs> um, and of course, people used to come up to, to London, probably more often people would come, and certainly when Sean was an MP and such like, he'd be based in London for large periods of time, so quite a few of us kept in, in close contact with Sean and her family, for instance. Um. Hi. I was wondering if when you go down to Wales and other Welsh people like Cliff, for example, who came to London, but other Welsh gays and lesbians who then felt brave enough to come out or you, I'm just wondering if that uh, had that kind of influence, you know, that you were visiting and then you're saying, people are saying, oh, it's great to see you, warm welcome, and then suddenly their child comes out as gay and that's a different story. You, you well, the, this, this um, event we went to in 2015, uh, there was a semi-professional uh, rugby player, a lesbian 
who uh, had just celebrated a civil partnership at Blind Ant Rugby Club and there were 300 guests from the community came along. So I think, you know, it, it's okay to be gay there now. Yeah. And we've also found out recently there's a Labour MP. Clyde. Is it Clyde? Um, Somebody, anyway, who, you'll have to help me out here. Who basically, we were around when he was a youngster, when he was a boy. Yeah. And we were. I think, I think you're talking about Adam Price, who, who was right. in the Clive Cymru MP. Sorry. Um, but yeah, he he spoken very movingly about um, the eighty four eighty five strike um, and him being a young teenager. His father was a minor. Um, he was a young teenager, and he saw his father talking to residents, guest sport minors, members, including myself and you. We were at an event in. Uh, Ammon for Rugby Club um, and his father and other minors were talking to us and shaking us by the hand and you know being really kind of warm and welcoming and normal towards us and that was the first time he ever thought perhaps I can tell my family that I'm gay without you know the kind of terrible reactions that I thought that he was expecting. Um, Andrew Wilson who's the director of um, Stonewall Cymru uh, has a very similar story about coming down in one morning and his father sitting at the breakfast table reading a, a story from the South Wales Echo about residents and gay sports minors and his parents having this conversation about residents and gay people and residents and gay sports minors and again not being derogatory, not being negative and antagonistic um, but speaking about us with respect. And for him, that was again the first time that he ever thought that he would be able to tell his family that he was gay without losing his family. Um, so I think we did have a dramatic Im impact on some people's lives. And, yeah. and it continues, as you're saying, Beth, uh, Beth and her girlfriend, who were yeah. born and brought up in uh, one of the communities of the Twin Gates. It's not one village. The film kind of makes out one village. It's actually in the Neath, the Life and Swansea Valley support group. So it's three valleys a number of communities in each valley mm -hmm. um, but they're from Seven Sisters they got married on the rugby field of Seven Sisters Rugby Club you know that is hallowed ground um, to, to be allowed to get have a same-sex wedding on the rugby field is quite extraordinary um, and you know I think it's part of our legacy <coughs> Any more questions? Um, what uh, campaigns are you involved in at the moment? What is your focus of your post election now? Well, we we've, we closed LGSM down again in uh, October 2015, was it? Yeah, having, having yeah. reformed in, to, in 2014 to yeah. take advantage of the interest around the film. Yeah. Uh, we just felt like we can't go on and on and on forever, you know, this is celebrating something we did 33 years ago. Uh, so we closed it down. Uh, there's just a very small number of us kind of running a, a Twitter page and, and, and the web page mm -hmm. and responding to speaker requests. Uh, so we're still, as you can see, we still get a lot of uh, interesting doing speaker requests. But other organisations have, have, have spawned on the back of, of what we did, uh, getting mentioned the uh, lessons of gay support, the migrants. Uh, there's also uh, been lesbian and gay support, the dockers in, in uh, Norway. Uh, and an emerging lessons and gay support to McDonald's workers. Yep. So if anybody wants to get behind that, L LGS McD. Yeah, yeah. Strike. Yeah. Not supporting McDonald's. Brilliant. Yeah. 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 I mean, we have tried to um, support other people. We, we we were lucky, privileged enough to be invited to support, support the um, uh, Ritzy Strikers. So we we've done stuff with them. We did we did stuff with uh, uh, Fire Brigade Union um, when they were striking for pension rights, um, the National Gallery strikers, we, we, we built up something, a relationship with them, um, and hopefully we'll continue to do that, but that's mainly as individuals, um, and we, you know, we try and lend our names to things that are useful, um, and obviously things that are specifically related to 
the miners' strike, because there is still unfinished business in relation to the miners' strike, all particularly in, in mm. relation to all grief. The all grief truth and justice campaign. There's people that we work, you know, we, we're really proud to support them. We we'll do anything we can to support them because that is unfinished business from eight four eight five. Um, the criminals in in the police in particular need to be brought to justice. Mm. Mm. And we're still going to historic things like the Durham Miners Gala, yeah, uh, and regional prides that are in uh, mining areas like Doncaster, yeah. But no, we're we're, we're more or less cl closed down, as I said, with except for the Twitter presence and speaker requests. We're all getting on a bit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm giving you, yeah. but I was still there, and oh, I think you don't keep. <laughs> Should we sign some books? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.